My free history. The Ottoman state developed another educational organization and curriculum structure to train people for the higher levels of the civil and military bureaucracies. This school, called Enderun, was a kind of palace school and its main objective was to give an elite education to promising young children from the empire's European lands to secure the rise through the military and civil bureaucracies according to their abilities. How the palace school came about is not entirely clear. Most books and articles decide not to talk about it at all. The most likely scenario is that Murat II founded the school. Then Murat's son Mehmed II probably made an institution out of it. Nevertheless, there are also reports that already under Bayezid I's and Mehmed I's rule, there were Christian children of great beauty in the palace. Belbor et al. notes that Mehmed II had the aim of every ruler who ever lived. He wanted to create an eternal empire. The school served as a major instrument to this end. A vital component to this goal was the establishment of a special school to select the most able youngsters within the empire and to educate them to become the members of the ruling class. Thus, Mehmed II improved the existing palace school founded by his father, Murat II, and established the Indurun Academy within his private residence at Dubkabi Palace in Istanbul. The literature lists the schools by two different descriptions. On the one hand, the schools are located by the cities or districts in which one could find them. There were Edirne and also Gallipoli. Goodwin describes the college at Gallipoli as the least exalted one. This was probably due to the fact that there the students trained to be sailors. For example, Schweitzer refers to an instance where Janissary called an admiral ship soldier disrespectfully. There also was a school in Galatasaray and or Pera, a part of modern-day Istanbul. And there was a school in Bursa. Here I should mention that only two sources, Hechelhammer and Nicole, mentioned this place. On the other hand, the researchers also identified the school by the palaces in which they were placed. Adirni Sarai, the first school to be created very likely by Murat II. Galatasaray followed next and probably is gone today. This is why I chose the only symbol I associate with Galata. Another school was the Ibrahim Basha Sarai at the Hippodrome at At Maidan. Its name reveals to us that it was founded by Ibrahim Basha. He was Grand Vizier to Suleiman the Magnificent and used the school for Bosnian and Albanian Devshumis only. The Iskander Salebi Sarai came last and I was unable to find this palace anywhere. The last three schools have to have been established by Mehmed II, since it was he who conquered Constantinople and all these schools are in Istanbul. Let's try to match the two lists. For some cases I can come up with an explanation. It is obvious that the Adirni Sarai is located in Adirni. The same holds for the Galatasaray. It is in the modern day district of Galatasaray and Pera. However, the Ibrahim Basha Sarai is in Istanbul and thereby fits to none of the geographical descriptions. Furthermore, the Iskander Salebi Sarai is a really tough nut. I was unable to crack. Maybe the palace is either at Gallipoli or Bursa, but since Google shows no results, it probably is a conspiracy and does not even exist in reality. Maybe a local to any of these places will listen to this and can explain how the two descriptions fit together. Let's continue. Not all schools did survive. Ibrahim Basha's array was temporarily closed in the mid-17th century by Ibrahim I, who also cut off the funds of Galata's array. Ibrahim Basha's array survived somehow. The colleges at Galata and the Derni were finally closed in the reign of Murat IV, when the levy as a method of recruiting for the Enderun effectively ended. Dear Godfrey Goodwin, I'm sure you did meticulous research, but something does not add up here. Murat IV came before Ibrahim I. In addition, Yilmaz mentions in a footnote that the students in Galatasaray were transferred to the other schools in 1675. Be it as it may, something about the listening of the ballast schools as well as the timeline is decidedly fishy. We better continue on.
There were subdivisions in the palace schools which were called rooms or chambers. To some degree they were comparable to today's class systems. On the bottom level were the small room and the big room. These halls served as preparatory classes for the higher levels of the school. The pages already had some duties, for example, they had the responsibility to offer towels and sherbet to the sultan. Both rooms had a similar level in the hierarchy. The sources are not exactly clear here. Maybe the students started in a small hall and moved to the big hall after one year, but in the end the halls had the name because of the sizes. While the small chamber was intended for 60 students, the big room was supposed to provide place for 100. Nevertheless, over the centuries both became overcrowded. Finally, in 1675, the Sultan abolished both halls and replaced them by the Edirne, Galata and Ibrahim Pasha palaces. The next level was the Falconer's Chamber, which had room for 40 people. In the literature, there is scarce information on this hall because it was abolished by Mehmed IV. The pages here had the task to accompany the Sultan on the hunt and care for his animals. Upwards in the hierarchy followed the expeditionary room with about 100 people. In 1606 boys who were chamberless pages before found their home here. This hall had its name because the pages here used to follow the Sultan of War. When looking at the civil tasks this seemed strange at first. They had to do the laundry of the Enderon people. In addition there were stokers, bath attendants, barbers and even musicians. This makes me guess that they accompanied the Sultan on campaign to keep him happy. The next chamber was the pantry room, also called Commissionary Chamber. The name tells us everything we need to know about the tasks of the pages in this hall. They had to care for everything related to food. Even a napkin master was attached to this chamber. It is tough to find numbers for this chamber. According to Rhodos Murphy, 100 pages would be a good guess for the year 1478. Next came the treasury room with some 70 pages. They cared for exactly what you think and therefore had to be absolutely trustworthy when handling jewels, money and other gems. And finally there were the Sultan's private rooms. 39 pages had the honor to work there since together with the Sultan they would number 40 which for some reason is a holy number resembling infinity. These privileged pages had to attend the Sultan in his bedchambers. No, not in the way you think, at least usually not. These pages were responsible for looking after the holy relics and doing personal services to the Sultan, including holding torches at night to keep away ghosts from the Sultan's bed, or more likely assassins. As you can imagine, a place in this hall had incredible worth. A page in the privy chamber was close to the Sultan and personally known to him. It was a guarantee for a great career and also a good source of income, since the Sultan put large sums of money into his pocket every morning and in the evening it was the page's privilege to keep the change. You might wonder how to distinguish between the pages in the different chambers. The answer is by looking at the clothes. In the lower levels, the small and the big room, the students wore so-called domamli, which had to be robbed. The students in the other chambers were known by the name kaftanli because they wore, you guessed it, kaftans. Summing up the numbers of the pages, this leaves us with a planned strength of 509 pages. Nevertheless, over the centuries, the numbers went up, probably adding some hundreds. Let's find out where to find the chambers in the Topkapi Palace. The small and the big room were on each side of the gate which led into the inner court of the palace. The rest of the chambers could be found around the courtyard. There was the expeditionary chamber, the pantry chamber, the treasury chamber and the privy chamber. The falconer's chambers is harder to find since it was demolished. Today in its place stands a mosque. Until now we have talked about the location and the organization. But schools are worth nothing if they do not have students. The students in the palace were called pages. In Turkish the name was Ich Oglan, which means inside boys or pages of the privy household, inside referring to inside the palace. In the beginning there was only Desiree in a journey and it was the sons of nobles who were taken in. This changed under Mehmed II. He denied entry to the nobles and accepted only Devshemis. 
This decision was part of a successful attempt to suppress the nobility. We have talked extensively about deaf chemie and its selection process. In order to get into a palace school, a boy had to endure even more selections. I would like to take you back to the point where the boys gathered through deaf chemie underwent the first examination. They were stripped in the presence of the chief of Janissaries and examined for bodily defects. All were then converted to Islam, circumcised and given Muslim names. We do not know how much the boys were informed in advance about the process by the kin or by officers after being selected. Yet it was perhaps at this moment that they sensed the enslavement. But for some of them, this was the chance of their lifetime. This was also the point at which the most talented and handsome were selected and sent to the palaces. Those who were selected for palace service were placed in one of four palaces, Iskandar Salebi, Galatasaray, Eterni or Ibrahim Pasha. Sometimes it even was the Sultan who personally picked his new slaves for his personal service. This is why palace pages and janissaries are often talked about at the same time. Technically they were not the same thing. Janissaries were soldiers and the pages were the future officers but also officials and administrators. But to which degree were they still soldiers? Janissaries in a narrow sense means the soldiers serving in the Janissary corps. A vizier certainly does not match this description. So why does every history of the Janissaries also include the highest officials? The answer is that after the opening of the school to deaf Shemis, both groups shared the same origin. They also shared the ceremony of entrance. The initiation ceremony began when the novice entered the third gate where he stood all alone for three days in silence with nobody addressing him. At the end of these three days of solitude, the gate's leading eunuch announced that he had joined the ranks of the ruling elite and reminded him that he had entered the gate of nobles. Where exactly a page would start of his career in the palace school changed over the centuries. As we have just heard in the very beginning, the pages started off directly in the Sarai. Later on, only a small hand-picked elite was sent directly to the palace, while the others had to attend one of the preparatory colleges. The secondary schools were for those who failed entry to the Enderun or Galata Sarai at first. It is an endearing and enduring Turkish quality which believes in a second chance, however, so does the possibility developed of graduating from a lesser college to that within the palace. Every three to seven years the most talented were selected to continue their education in the Enderun, the palace school, and the rest were sent to the Capiculu corps to become soldiers. Many researchers attribute the success of the early Ottoman Empire to the outstanding education of an elite in the Indurun schools. Therefore, we should look at the curriculum more closely. The boys' new environment was strictly controlled and in the highly coded palace culture, mistakes were easy to make. In order to prevent such lapses, the first lessons were in regards to the etiquette. They were taught to be humble and polite, to show reverence by holding their heads bowed with the hands crossed before them and to kiss the hands of their superiors as a sign of respect. Although probably having drawn a better lot than their comrades who were trained to be soldiers, this did not give them freedom by any means. The daily schedule was meticulously organized, each hour had its appointed task. The times for waking up, praying, eating, sleeping, exercising and studying were all specified. They had to walk sedately, eat slowly, bathe weekly, shave regularly, wear well-pressed clothes and perform the five daily prayers. All of this happened under the sharp eyes of eunuchs and tutors and aside of sticking to court etiquette served the purpose of learning. There were five key areas to study. Islamic sciences, which included the Quran, Arabic, Islamic jurisprudence and the history of prophets. In the fine arts, the students would learn about music and instruments, ornamentation and calligraphy. The humanities included Turkish and Persian, poetry, construction history, arithmetic, geometry and algebra. The physical training covered a combination of sports and military skills, like horsemanship, weapons like swords and bow and arrow. They improved their body power through wrestling, weightlifting and javelin throwing. 
And finally, they had vocational training in which they learned some kind of craftsmanship. Common was leatherworks, maintenance of clothing, construction, jewelry and medicine. In addition to these mandatory courses, a student could pick additional classes according to his abilities. In the end, they were expected to succeed at least in one art field while also excelling on military topics. The studying mostly happened in the place where the pages also slept, the chambers. Each one was assigned a small place on the platform in his dormitory where he slept at night and studied during the day. Pages living in different dormitories came into contact with one another only in the communal mosque of the third court where they prayed four times a day. In the interval between the fourth and fifth prayers, pages were allowed to talk quietly in the dormitories, where they also performed the last prayer. In all the dormitories, the pages slept in small beds in long rectangular halls that were illuminated the whole night with torches, so that the gate boys and eunuchs could monitor their behavior. Itziboglu presents a sketch of the large chamber. Ten pages shared a stall. Between two quarters slept two eunuchs. If a page dared to be nasty, a eunuch would bring him to the center and punish him. In the lower right corner were the stokers responsible for heating the chamber and the bath. In the beginning, in stall number 12, lived the royal princes who received their education in the Indurun. Each stall had a name. Sometimes they described the function of the pages living in there. Sometimes they had such telling names like flea ward or louse ward. A newcomer would start in a stall with the lowest number and if proving able move up from quarter to quarter until he reached the next chamber. That leaves the question, what would happen when a page left the school? Pages lived and worked in the inside of the palace. That's why the school was called Enderun, the internal service. But the Sultan also had some serfs working outside. These external services were called Biran, and that is where Page's career path could take him. The boy selected for the school might have been lucky, but as long as they stayed in school the pressure lingered. The privileges could end very quickly. A page could be asked to leave when he was deemed to have reached the end of his capacity for learning or for personal service to the Sultan, or when he himself preferred to. Some left or graduated after the course in the big and little chamber, others after a few years of service in the pantry, campaign or treasury chambers. A student could leave the palace school under the following circumstances. First, the educators deemed him unfit to rise further in the hierarchy of the chambers and come closer to the sultan's person. Second, the student's capacity for learning was exhausted. Third, the student himself asked to be relieved of his duties when he preferred to take up an office instead of continuing his education. Students who left the school in such ways that is on the lower levels of the chambers took up positions in the outer service. Their occupation depended on their education and on the stage of education they were in when they left. Examples were gatekeepers, groundsmen, supervisors in the kitchens or the stables, tentsmen, message runners and bannersmen like the musicians in the marching band. Others with talents and training in the arts or artisanship could find employment in the workshops of the palace or the administration of the palace. There they served the scribes in the chancery or treasury. They also worked in a multitude of studios and workshops as calligraphers, painters, gold and silversmiths. Having a position at palace was not equal to a peaceful life. Whenever the need arose, everyone from the lowest ranking janissaries to the scribe was expected to take up arms and serve the sultan. However, most students joined one of the six household cavalry regiments anyway. Some even became janissary officers and took command of the comrades who went through Devshimi with them but were not selected for the palace. Although they left the school early, they still drew big benefits from it. An ordinary janissary received two akches a day. In contrast, the novices had an allowance of seven to eight akches per day. In the higher ranks, they got up to twelve. In addition, they had prospects to get their own tima. But the potential for the really big money would only come after leaving the school. A graduate of the small or the big chamber would go to military units like the armorers or the sipahi household cavalry. Here they earned 18 to 20 akches per day. 
Compare this to the two actors of an ordinary Janissary and you will understand that this still was a big promotion compared to a regular Def Chemie. Pages leaving the school from the pantry or treasury ward had good chances of becoming the governor of a province, maybe even a Sanchak, and having an influential marriage. Very often the future wife would be a daughter of the Sultan. These were the ways to leave school without going through every level of the education. A fourth way was to graduate by passing through every chamber. A page going through all stages of the school would spend an average of 14 years on his education. The preparatory schools alone took 7 to 8 years, but 2 years at minimum. Naturally, the graduates from the privy chamber made the biggest move and occupied the highest offices. All in all, 79 Grand Viziers, 3 Sheikh al-Islam and 36 Chief Admirals finished their education here. Among them are so well-known names like Kuprilo Mehmet Pasha. For such successful pages, there was a ceremony. Approaching the grand gate, that is the gate of felicity, to exit from it, dressed in brocade, each one of them carries a golden ornament on his forehead, studded with jewels worth 300 scudi, and each holds a handkerchief in his hand, in which are about 1000 aspers. And at the gate they find horses, on which they mount in great triumph scattering the coins that they carry in the handkerchiefs as they ride, carrying with them all the articles that they have acquired in the seraglio. Through spreading the money there also was something in the ceremony for the other pages. But it became even better. Eunuchs would throw silver basins filled with coin into the court among the lower ranking pages. Of course in the Enderon everything had to be a test of some kind. It is then a marvelous pleasure to watch them scramble for the coins and fight with one another for the basin, which passes from hand to hand until one of them captures it and is able to throw it to the pages of the caftan. For now, let's leave the pages scrambling for gold and look at the typical career. Such a career could look as follows, although more successful students would jump the earlier levels. At first, a graduate could get a post as a military administrative commander in the province, the so-called Umera. In wartime, they organized the team holding Sipahis. A commander of an Umera could become a district governor, a Sanchebek, who commanded the territorial squadron of the Sipahis. There were around 200 of them. Of those, around 20 could become a Pasha, who was a district governor. As Beckelbeck, they commanded a bigger province and were under the direct command of the imperial council. Some of those Beckelbecks even were viziers. If they distinguished themselves in an extraordinary way, they were invited to join the imperial council, the divan in the Topkapi. You see, climbing the career ladder to its end was extremely unlikely. The last option was to not leave the school at all, but to become a teacher. Some Dev Chemies even became chief white eunuchs. Judging by the fact that the chief white eunuch was the head of the inner service and thus the highest ranking palace official, furthermore that some at least attained the highest offices in the realm, even almost routinely became Grand Viziers, there may have been ordinary Dev Chemie recruits who volunteered for castration to prolong their palace careers and to obtain provincial office at the highest possible rank. And this probably is a good place to take a look at what we learned today. The palace school started under Murat II but it reached its traditional form under Mehmet II. First it was a method of suppressing conquered elites and integrating them into the Ottoman system. There were schools in Edirne, Gallipoli, Bursa and Galatasaray, but the most prestigious one was in the Topkapi, the Sultan's palace in Istanbul. The school system in the Topkapi had different levels to chambers. Altogether there were 500 or more pages in the school. A student would climb the career ladder through the chambers until he could not keep up anymore. Only a few managed to bath through every stage and serve the Sultan directly in his privy chambers. Depending on their success, graduates would get prestigious posts in the empire after leaving the school. During the multiple years the boy spent in the school, they studied Islam, fine arts and humanities, especially languages. They had to do some physical training too and learn a craft. And now it's your turn again. 
Do you have any guesses regarding the placement of the palaces with schools? So long, we'll meet again in two weeks. Stay critical, stay curious, stay free.